Welcome to another spooky Halloween tale. Today is the turn of Chips and this is another spooky tale from the author of A Christmas Carol and Oliver Twist, one Charles Dickens and this was published around the year 1860. But remember with all those wholesome tales this is also the guy that wrote down Captain Murderer. Check out my video up there. And like the tale of Captain Murderer, this tale was relayed to Charles Dickens by his wonderful nanny, who must have had quite a turn for the macabre. And this is another one that haunted him and stuck with him all of his life. So without further ado, let's get right in. So there was once a shipwright and he wrought in a government owned yard and his name was Chips, as was his father and his father's father and his great grandfather all the way back as far as he could remember. Now, Chips's father had sold his soul to the devil in exchange for an iron pot, a bushel of nails, half a ton of copper, and a talking rat, as had his father, his grandfather, and his great-grandfather before him. This bargain had run down the family for generations, each Chips making the same pact with the devil and getting the same thing out of it. So one day, when Chips was working at the dockyard all alone, darkness crept in and the devil appeared before him, saying, a lemon has pips, a yard has ships, an isle have chips. Now Chips looked up from his work at this and saw the devil before him and saw that he had saucer-like eyes that spit blue fire continuously. Whenever he winked his eyes, blue sparks came out. His eyelashes made sounds like clatterings of flint and steel every time he blinked. Hanging over one of his arms was an iron pot and in that arm he held a bushel of tenpenny nails. Under his other arm was half a ton of copper and sat on that arm was a rat. And the devil said to him again, a lemon has pips, a yard has ships, and I'll have chips. Now Chips ignored him and continued with his work. And the rat asked him what he was doing. And Chips answered that he was putting in new planks for in this ship because rats had chewed through the old ones. But at this, the rat said, well, we'll chew through them too. We'll let in the water, we'll drown the crew and we'll eat them too. And Chips said, you're welcome to just leave me alone to do my work. However, he should have been more circumspect in his words. Now Chips was sorely tempted by the copper and the nails as they were the backbone of a shipwright's work and he wanted them badly. Now the devil saw what he was looking at and said that Chips might as well secure the bargain as his forefathers had and save himself all the hassle and having to, you know, get this stuff on his own. But Chips said that he liked the copper, he liked the pot, he liked the nails, but he didn't like the rat. And the devil fiercely replied that he could not have one without the other and he turned to leave. Now Chips, afraid of losing all this copper and iron and all these nails in order to do his craft, bade the devil to, you know, wait a minute, um, let me hold them and we'll see. And so when Chips was holding the iron pot, the ton of copper, the rat and the nails, the devil disappeared. The deal struck. Now Chips sold the copper and he sold the nails. He didn't use them. And he made to sell the iron pot, but he put the rat inside it first. But the dealer dropped the pot and the rat came out and he said he didn't want an iron pot with a rat inside of it. As you wouldn't. And so at this, because he couldn't get rid of the rat, Chips resolved to kill it. It was just a rat after all. Now one day when Chips was alone in the yard, he had a great kettle of hot pitch on one side of him and the iron pot with the rat in it on the other. He turned the scalding pitch into the pot and filled it full. Then he kept his eye upon it until it cooled and hardened and then he let it stand for twenty days. And then he heated the pitch again and turned it back into the kettle. 
and then he sank the pot in water for twenty days more, and then he got the smelters to put it in the furnace for twenty days more, and then they gave him it out, red hot and looking like red hot glass instead of iron. Yet there was the rat in it, just the same as ever. And the moment it caught his eye, it said with a jeer, A lemon has pips, and a yard has ships, and I'll have chips. Chips now felt certain in his own mind that the rat would stick to him. The rat, answering his thought, said, I will, like pitch. Now, as the rat leaped out of the pot when it had spoken and made off, Chips began to hope that it wouldn't keep its word. But, of course, that is not where our story ends, and the very next day, terrible, terrible things began to happen. When Chips put his hand in his trouser pocket, there was a rat there, not the same one. In his hat, he found another. In his handkerchief, another. And in the sleeves of his coat, when he pulled it on, there was a rat in each sleeve. And from that time, he found himself so frightfully intimate with all the rats in the yard that they climbed up his legs when he was at work and sat on his tools while he used them. And they could all speak to one another and he understood what they said. And they got into his lodging and into his bed and into his teapot and into his beer and into his boots. And he was going to be married to a corn chandler's daughter. And when he gave her a work box he himself had made for her, a rat jumped out of it. And when he put his arm round her waist, a rat clung about her. So the marriage was broken off, though the bands were already twice put up, which the parish clerk well remembers, for, as he handed the book to the clergyman for the second time of asking, a large rat ran over the leaf. Now you may believe that this was all very terrible to Chips, but even all this was not the worst. He knew besides what the rats were doing, whenever they were, so sometimes he would cry aloud when he was at his club at night. Oh, keep the rats out of the convict's burying ground. Don't let them do that. Or... There's one of them at the cheese downstairs. Or, there's two of them smelling at the baby in the garret. Or other things of that sort. And at last he was voted mad and lost his work in the dockyard and could get no other. Now you might be feeling sorry for Chips and that would be quite natural. But he wasn't out of work for long for there came a time when sailors were needed again. And so Chips was made a sailor yet again. He rode in the little boat and was brought to the big ship, three-masted, beautiful. And as he rode underneath the figurehead, which he himself was making when the devil had first appeared to him, and he saw as the little boat went underneath the figurehead, that the talking rat was sat on its head. And on locking eyes with him, it called out to him, Chips ahoy, old boy! We're eating the planks, we'll let the water in, we'll drown the crew, and we'll eat them too. Now the ship was bound for the Indies and set sail that very same night. Chip's feelings were dreadful, and they got worse with each night that he spent on the ship. And with each day, he grew more and more terrified, because he could understand what the rats were thinking and what they were doing down there in the dark. He resolved at last to speak to the admiral of the ship, and he went down on his knees in the captain's cabin. Your honour, unless your honour, without a moment's loss of time, makes sail for the nearest shore, this is a doomed ship, and her name is the Coffin. Young man, your words are madman's words. Your honour, no, they are nibbling us away. They? Your honour, them dreadful rats, dust and hollowness where solid oak ought to be. Rats nibbling a grave for every man on board. Oh, does your honour love your lady and your pretty children? Then for God's sake, make for the nearest shore, for at this present moment the rats are all stopping in their work and are all looking straight towards you with bare teeth and are all saying to one another that you shall never, 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 never see your lady and your children more. The Admiral, of course, thought that the guy was crazy and sent for the doctor. And so Chips was bled and blistered and pulled to and fro for six whole days and nights in an effort to cure his madness, rather than just throwing him overboard. At the end of this week-long trial of doctors and whatever they were doing to him, he went back to the Admiral and went again on his knees in the captain's cabin and said, Now, Admiral, you must die. You took no warning. You must die. 
The rats are never wrong in their calculations, and they make out that they'll be through at twelve o'clock tonight. So you must die, with me and all the rest. And so, at twelve o'clock, there was a great leak reported in the ship, and a torrent of water rushed in and nothing could stop it. And they all went down, every living soul. And what the rats, being water rats, left of chips, at last floated to shore, and sitting on him was an immense overgrown rat, laughing, that dived when the corpse touched the beach and never came up. And there was a great deal of seaweed on the remains. And if you get thirteen bits of seaweed and dry them and burn them in the fire, they will go off like in these thirteen words as plain as plain can be. A lemon has pips, and a yard has ships, and I've got chips.